All right, welcome back to General Chemistry. Uh, we've finally made it to Chapter 2 here, and so we're going to talk about some of these ideas that relate atoms and elements together, and we're going to discuss, you know, how um, molecules are made up and some of the basic ideas about how we're going to classify matter because remember it's the matter that we want to study that's what chemistry is so we're using uh, Tro's textbook here chemistry a molecular ap approach that's the third edition and so um, let's get started so the idea essentially that we're looking at is if you were to take something say like a pencil lead uh, which is just a piece of graphite it's not lead but we call it lead and if you cut that and cut it and cut that sample and then cut the piece that comes off of that and cut that piece again and cut that in half and then cut it in half and in half and in half it, would you eventually get to a point where you could no longer divide that piece of graphite anymore and if so what is that point and what does it look like and so of course we know today that we would eventually end up with just carbon atoms in front of us because that's the smallest piece of what graphite is. But historically that wasn't necessarily clear and that wasn't known well from the beginning. The Greek word for atom is atomos and it comes obviously meaning indivisible or uncuttable, something that you cannot cut any further it's the smallest part or the smallest identifiable part of something that you can have so you can't divide this carbon atom down into a smaller piece or smaller pieces and still have what we know as carbon of course today we know there are subatomic particles protons and neutrons and electrons and we're going to talk about where those come from uh, in chapter two here but you can't have a smaller piece of carbon than one atom of carbon. So this is the smallest identifiable piece of matter. And of course, we know that atoms compose all matter. All the matter around us, all the matter that exists is made up out of atoms. Now, that's of course not including matter that's made solely of subatomic particles, but this is all the matter that's identifiable as something unique, as a particular element. Because if you had protons you would just have a pile of protons or neutrons or a stream of electrons or something but it's not identifiable as a separate substance so the this idea has been known for a long time and, and is proposed historically and several experiments were done that we'll look at in establishing exactly where that came from but it's important for you to know today that we can actually see and move atoms using the technique called scanning tunneling microscopy or scanning, scanning tunneling microscopes allow you to actually measure the um, potential difference between the tip of your uh, microscope or the tip of your instrument and the surface that you're interested in. So you're moving this tip up and down, back and forth, so that you're maintaining a particular amount of potential difference between the tip and your surface. So this way you're able to say, oh look, right here it goes up by one atom, and that going up by one atom is going to create a different potential for the tip of my microscope here. And so it's going to measure a different amount of electricity passing through, and then it's going to know, oh, that corresponds to one atom rise. And so with this technique you're able to do a ton of stuff to explore surfaces and do some really amazing chemistry to really understand and pretty much see atoms. Now that's C in quotes because you don't see it the same way you see normal stuff by light bouncing off of it and back to your eye. You see this by, f by measuring the potential difference between the tip and the surface. And you know that corresponds to atom changes. And so it turns out then that you're really using this technique to probe the smallest identifiable unit of an element which is called an atom. And these atoms are going to be one of the major studies of what we look at in chemistry, how atoms are bonded together to form molecules, and what the atoms are doing since atoms make up all of the matter that we're going to study predominantly. So even though atoms are sub-microscopic, you can't see them with regular microscopes, you have to have special techniques to, to look at atoms. And there is a lot of different types of atoms. We know about the periodic table in the front cover of your book. You can see a giant periodic table that lists them all and gives you all the names and all the symbols and um, you can see the, the list there gives you all the masses and everything. And those are the elements that we're talking about here on the periodic table of elements. So there's about 90, 91 
naturally occurring elements and over 20 synthetic elements and a synthetic element is one that's not just found in nature found naturally in nature so to speak uh, the synthetic element is one that's like created in the lab or created at the particle accelerator or something along those lines so uh, we want to get a closer look at exactly what these atoms are and like I said before we're able to actually see them and manipulate them so here's a picture that shows atoms that were lined up uh, to spell out a message um, in Chinese. I don't remember exactly what it says, but you can see we're not only able to measure and know the atoms are there, but we're actually able to move them into particular locations on surfaces, which is amazingly crazy. So this idea kind of originated with the ancient Greeks, but not the popular ancient Greeks. So Democritus is the main name that you want to know here. He was the one that said all matter is composed of small indestructible particles. He wrote nothing exists except atoms, empty space, and everything else is opinion. So he thought there would eventually reach a point where things were uncuttable. You can't get any smaller than this. That's what everything is made out of. Now, of course, that's a very rudimentary idea at the time he proposed it, and he was kind of laughed off um, because his idea was not the main one or the popular one. Now, the main one belonged, of course, to Aristotle and Plato, which essentially said there are no smallest parts. Everything that's made up is made of fire, air, earth, and water. I'm sure you've probably heard these ideas before. And these ideas of Aristotle and the ideas of Democritus did not mesh together well at all. So pretty much Democritus' ideas got shoved to the side and Aristotle's ideas got promoted and studied more. And it wasn't until way later that we actually found out, oh, Democritus seems to have known what he was talking about, whether he knew it or not. But his ideas have been verified. So essentially, the story really happens, the story really turns when we get to John Dalton, an English chemist, and he was convinced of the evidence that showed that things were really made out of atoms. He was the one that had the atomic theory. He proposes an atomic theory, and we'll look at the different points in the atomic theory as we go along here. And so he went back to Democritus' idea, and I don't know that John Dalton knew that Democritus had proposed this and then he proposed it also. He probably came up with this idea on his own through doing some experiments and whatnot, and then he went back to see, oh look, Democritus also supported this idea. This is the theory that all matter is composed of atoms, and essentially this idea came out of doing experiments and knowing about some different laws. And there were three main laws that led Dalton to this idea, to the atomic theory, Dalton's atomic theory. That's the law of the conservation of mass, which we saw in chapter one, that matter, matter is neither created nor destroyed, um, that what you had at the beginning of the chemical reaction is the same matter you have at the end. It may have broken bonds and rearranged or something along those lines. The law of definite proportions, which we're going to talk about, and the law of multiple proportions. And these three ideas really kind of sync together and support the atomic hypothesis, and we'll show how. So this law of conservation of mass, remember Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry, was the one who did a lot of studying on this. And essentially you have, in a chemical reaction, matter, matter uh, excuse me, is neither created nor destroyed may have broken apart, may have rebonded in a different way, there was a chemical reaction, but what you had in the reaction, before the reaction, during the reaction, and after is the same atoms that were there, maybe rearranged. So matter is not being destroyed or converted or changed into anything else. It's still the atoms that made everything up before at the end. So if you start with sodium, and you take some chlorine gas and you add these two together and you do a chemical reaction you end up with sodium chloride now sodium chloride looks completely different than chlorine and than sodium but the matter that was here before the sodium and the chlorine is still here after even though it looks completely different because we know this is made up of sodium chloride crystals and we can calculate how much matter was there and how much matter is there now, and et cetera. We find that the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products. 19.6 grams total ended up with 19.6 grams. This is something that's pretty hard to do in the lab unless you're being extremely careful. But 19.6, you probably, you probably could see that. 
And of course this idea is really consistent with the atomic theory because this is what you would expect if things were really composed out of small indestructible parts that we're going to call atoms then you would expect that the atoms that are there to begin with are going to be the atoms that are there at the end. And so it matches with that idea, although it doesn't directly lead you to that idea. Next we have the law of definite proportions. And so in 1797, Joseph Proust made some observations about different compounds. And essentially he summarized these observations into the law of definite proportions, which says all samples of a given compound regardless of their source or how they were prepared have the same proportions of their constituent elements. Now take some time to think about what this is saying. We're taking compounds from different sources and we're comparing them to show that they have the same proportions of the elements that they're made out of. So whether you take water from the ocean or water that was a byproduct of a chemical reaction or water that you came from somewhere else, from electrolysis or something. When you study water and you take it down to the masses of the different pieces that make it up, you'll find out that there's the same proportion of hydrogen and oxygen, no matter where the water came from or where the source was found. So here's kind of an example with some numbers. If you had a decomposition, excuse me, if you had some water and you decomposed it, say you had 18 grams, you would get 16 grams of oxygen, 2 grams of hydrogen. This makes a ratio of 8 to 1 for all water. No matter what water you had, no matter how much you had, no matter where you got it from, it would have a mass ratio of 8 to 1. This is the law of definite proportions. Okay, how does that relate to the law of multiple proportions? Well, remember Dalton, the guy who proposed the atomic theory, which we'll look at in detail in a, in a couple of slides, in 1804 he said that when two elements call them A and B if you want, form different compounds. The masses of element B that combine with one gram of element A can be expressed as a ratio of small whole numbers. Now all those words just to say that an atom of A combines with either one, two, three, or more atoms of B. AB1, AB2, AB3, etc. And it doesn't do it in such a way where you have a fraction of an atom. That's key. So it's not AB2.5. It's not A, B, 0 0.36. That doesn't make sense because remember Dalton says things are made out of atoms. You can only have one atom. You can't have anything smaller than that. You can have two atoms or three atoms or four atoms, but you can't have fractions of atoms. And this is kind of what the, the law of multiple proportions is talking about. So here's an example. If you have carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, two compounds composed both of carbon and of oxygen, and you take their mass ratios carbon in carbon dioxide 2.67 to 1 so 2.67 grams of oxygen 1 gram of carbon and in carbon monoxide 1.33 grams for 1 gram of carbon now if you take the ratio of those two the mass of oxygen in both of those you get two a small whole number which is what's predicted by the law of multiple proportions because you're always going to have a particular whole number of atoms combining together to form your compounds if things are made out of atoms. So those three ideas, definite proportions, multiple proportions, and conservation of mass, Dalton used, as well as experiments and other observations, to come up with his atomic hypothesis. So this is a pretty, uh, excuse me, this is a pretty important concept. You need to take the time to understand these four points of the atomic theory I'll probably even ask you if, um, eventually, if I get the opportunity, what the different pieces are in Dalton's atomic theory. Or I'll ask you, I'll give you a choice of like five different things and say which one was part of Dalton's atomic theory. And I may reword these to sound all weird and everything. So you need, need to really know what they are. Number one, each element is composed of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. Simple enough. That's kind of pretty much the, what we believe today to be true. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from the atoms of other elements. He's saying here that I can see an element of iron and I can see an element of aluminum and I can, if I could see their atoms and compare them, they would have something different about them such that iron and other iron atoms behave like iron and aluminum and other aluminum atoms behave like aluminum. 
Further, Dalton said that atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. This would make sense because you can't have fractions of atoms, like I said earlier. And that atoms of one element cannot change into atoms of another element. In a chemical reaction, atoms only change the way they are bonded together with other atoms, but they don't change from one element to another. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about chemical reactions here. This is very much true of chemical reactions. Uh, this is not true if we're talking about nuclear reactions where we can adjust how many protons are in the nucleus based on doing some uh, crazy nuclear experiments. But in chemical reactions, it's very much something that, that um, is true. Now, we know today that atoms are made up of different things, and it's not quite as simple as Dalton states it here. But for the most part, these ideas, if taken in the right way, are very much true. Now, what are the other things that atoms are made out of? Electrons, protons, and neutrons. And we need to talk about how those were discovered and who discovered them. And so we can have this clear understanding and idea in our mind about what atoms are. And I think we'll do that in the next lecture. See you then.